Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Larry Laterman, and I am the chair of the Ambassador Speaker Series here at Carleton University. Welcome to this, the second session in this academic year. Before introducing our featured speaker, the Ambassador Costa Rica's Excellency Roberto Dormont, I would first like to recognize some of our guests. I'd like to recognize first the High Commission of Cameroon, His Excellency, Excellency Solomon Azumbi, the um, Ambassador of Guatemala, Her Excellency Rita Cleverly Picholi. You can say that. <laughs> Um, the Ambassador of Algeria, His Excellency Hossein Negat. <laughs> the Ambassador of Turkey, His Excellency Selce Gunal. Uh, and we did have the Ambassador of Haiti, who had to be because I'm late and I apologize. Um, and of course, Ambassador Dormon's wife, Gabriela, and his family and colleagues of the Embassy of Costa Rica. We're also pleased to have representatives from the embassies of Spain, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba. And I would also like to note that we have here are some former Canadian ambassadors. Um, Mr. Alan Cullum, former Canadian ambassador to OAS in Venezuela, the former Canadian ambassador to the Philippines and Switzerland, Robert Collette, the former Canadian ambassador to Russia, Ukraine, and three or four other countries, Chris Westall, and uh, former Canadian ambassador to Vietnam, Gabriel Lessard, and uh, my good friend, uh, same class de promotion, Larry Dickinson, our former ambassador to Kuwait and Indonesia. And also members of the Canadian government, including Global Affairs, Natural Resources, Canadian Intellectual Property, and students and faculty from Carleton University and the University of Ottawa. And we're especially uh, pleased by the presence of the director of the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México Agatino, Dr. Ramón Peralta Fabi. Good evening. Bonsoir, buenas noches. Uh, I feel very privileged to be here with you tonight. Uh, dear Excellencies, thank you for coming. Uh, former ambassadors, um, ladies and gentlemen, professors, students. Thank you for this great opportunity to, to share with you a small part of Costa Rica's history, aspirations, and role in the world. Thank you to the organizers of the Ambassador Speaker Series, especially Monsieur Lawrence, I pronounce Letterman, uh, and a special gratitude to Carlton for hosting us tonight. Being in this university is very important to my country as we wish to strengthen the relationship between the Academy of Canada and Costa Rica in many areas. Vice President Pauline Rankin can attest of her closeness. I have walked the gardens and aisles of this campus and visited several departments and schools of this prestigious institution more than a few years this time. I also want to thank you before uh, I continue my staff for all the research for this uh, uh, speech, and certainly my family for uh, uh, the editing and the French. So the pronunciation, it's, it, it's me. <laughs> Costa Rica, mon pays, est petit en territoire, environ la même sup superficie du lac Héron. Me ran en rêve et désir pour le bien-être de notre peuple et tout monde entier. Nous avons suivi notre propre chemin. Nous, en Costa Rica, nous avons fait les choses différemment. We became independent in 1821. By 1869, we had made education mandatory for both girls and boys, and this has certainly paid off. As per constitutional mandate, we have to invest 8% of, of our GDP in public edu education. Our teachers and professors have achieved, have achieved amazing results. According to the World Economic Forum in Latin America, the quality of Costa Rican educational system is ranked number one. We have the most availability of scientists and engineers, as well as availability of special, specialized research and training services. And we are also first in Latin America in the quality of math 
and science education. Le bilingualism est très important pour le Costa Rica. Nous sommes le pays numéro un en Amérique latine en compétence de l'utilisation de la langue, langue anglaise au travail et dans les matrices de la langue anglaise pour des fins académiques. In our, in our path towards strengthening our education and culture, we have understood the importance of multiculturalism and consequently we have recently joined the Francophonie and we have great expectations to collaborate with the organization and its members. The value of education for both Canada and Costa Rica is certainly immense. We have shared a tradition of students and the distinguished professor exchanges, but the numbers have been few. Now we want to be more ambitious and, and we believe that we can and should elevate these numbers of exchanges. Throughout Canada, my fellow Costa Ricans are specializing in the fields of arts and sciences that will make them certainly better citizens of the world. These vibrant and fruitful exchanges shall motivate us to commit to the, to the challenges we now face. For example, the Memorandum of Youth Mobility needs to be strengthened and extended by promoting it together so more youngsters of our countries will be able to take advantage of these positively life-changing experiences. Officials of Carlton know, know that every time I come here, I talk about the great possibilities of this memorandum of understanding. Special, specifically, we're exploring the opportunity of having Carlton students visiting our precious national parks and learn from volunteering in them. I hope this project becomes a re reality in the short term. You also, we also have to increase our participation quotas in the Memorandum of Understanding. We have a reduced number. Facilitating migratory procedures are topics in which a respectful dialogue should continue in order to harvest from the effective internationalization of our people. Building on our fruitful conversation Building on our fruitful conversation with Carlton, we have traveled Canada to engage with other universities and scholars. For example, in Alberta, British Columbia and Quebec. The sentiment of professors and students is the same. They want more. The time to hear the voice of those who are in action is now. It's time to understand within a, bi within a bilateral framework, framework that, we, that what we do today is essential since our youth do not want to wait. They want opportunities today. Many have come to our door in search for those opportunities, and we are committed to work effectively with Canada to jointly help them find those paths towards knowledge. Both young Canadians and Costa Rica, using new technologies, are front runners in the world of academic de development. For them, we shall be facilitators of the holistic education that only international experience can provide. Thanks to the highly talented population we have, Costa Rica has been able to create a diversified and robust economy. Only 40 years ago, our economy heavily relied in agricultural products, which are extremely, extremely important for our country and our culture. We still produce and export among the best coffee in the world. This is because Reed is here. <laughs> Otherwise, I would say <laughs> top two. <laughs> we are the number one producer of pineapple and other agricultural products, which are the delight of Canadians and international consumer, consumers. Everything in compliance with sustainable production practices. However, we have vigorously transformed ourselves into a knowledge economy. International services, software development, animation and audiovisual production are booming. And only this year, our main export will be medical devices. We host a cluster of more than 75 international companies in the life sciences sector. We have been champions in clinical research and a recently enacted piece of le legislation will give us again the opportunity to lead in this area. In 2014, the World Bank 
informed that Costa Rica is the first high-tech exporter of industrial products in Latin America as a per percentage of manufactured goods. Also, the World Economic Forum gave us the first place in quality relations, labor relations, meaning cooperation, employer, employee. Also, it gave us, gave us the first place in Latin America in innovation and business sophistication. San Jose, our capital, is ranked as number one outsourcing city in Latin America. The future is also bright. As the Financial, as the financial Times stated, that we will be the first country for future foreign direct investment in Central America and the Caribbean. Thus, as you can see, the conditions are given to continue fostering business development and opportunities between our nations. We certainly aspire more foreign direct investment from Canada to Costa Rica. We are the second exporter of medical devices in Latin America. We have developed a master's program in, medic in medical devices with the University of Minnesota. In this regard, we are exploring similar opportunities with Carleton University. Companies such as Boston Scientific are, all the, are already doing research and development in Costa Rica. Research and development is happening in other fields. Companies such as Intel, Ad Astra, and Nanotechnology. Costa Rica has also created the legal framework to foster a very, very open economy by having entered into free trade agreements, which gives us access to almost 60 countries in the world, 2.5 billion people and 66% of the, of the world's wide GDP. As in Canada, in Costa Rica, we have created in the 1940s a universal healthcare system with universal coverage meaning neither deductibles nor exclusions are applied, including everything that is clinic clinically justified. Our healthcare system makes an implicit, implicit pledge a rea reality. Nobody gets poor in Costa Rica due to, il to illness. To, to me, one of the consequences of this is that we have certainly become the happiest country in the, in the planet, according to the P Happy Planet, Planet Index 2014. With, with first world word indicators. Our life expectancy is 80 plus years. We have a chronic disease burden. We are, our population is aging and we certainly have a low birth rate. Medical travel has been on the rise in previous years. We, we receive around 50,000 visits for medical procedures per year. Our hospitals and clinics possess the required international accreditations and this has resulted in an industry generating more than 350 uh, US million dollars per year. This well-being that, that I have described has been possible, possible because we live in the oldest democracy of Latin America with very, very solid institutions. Also in the 40s, a unique decision was taken by Costa Rica, the abolition of the army. This decision has indeed shaped our nature and influenced our pillar, pillars of foreign policy and has created a nation committed to peace, solidarity, and the promotion and defense of human rights. Peace within our borders, becoming the safest country in the region, peace with its neighbors and man mankind, similarly to the Canadian tradition that has resulted in the admiration and praise of the world toward both nations. Canada and Costa Rica aim to have a world living in harmony, where human beings shall enjoy the wonders of creation and pursue the dream of happiness. But this dream can become rea reality only if we work passionately to create opportunities for all. And here, here lay our country's biggest challenges. Costa Rica has continuously and vigorously pursued the ideal of peace with efforts and events such as the abolition of the army, but this tradition has evolved with constant dynamism. In 1980, the United Nations approved the creation of the University for, for Peace in Costa Rican soil. In 1986, the Nobel P Peace Prize was awarded to a Costa Rican for our efforts and commitment to peace within the region. 
Costa Rica has actively, promote, has actively promoted global disarmament. Specifically, it has been a champion of the Cluster Munition Treaty, the Arms Trade Treaty, and many, many efforts related to the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. My country is committed to peace since we have been educated in peace. Lester Pearson's dream is dreamt by Costa Rican as well. He said, of all our dreams today, there is none more important or so, or so hard to realize than that of peace in the world. Maybe we never, may we never lose our faith in it or our resolve to do everything that can be done to convert it one day into reality. We salute the position and importance of the new elected Canadian authorities with regards to the protection of the environment and climate change. We are convinced that together we will work positively towards common goals and aspirations in these grounds. As part of the Geneva Pledge for Human Rights in Climate Change Action, Costa Rica works on behalf of our people in defense of a climate system that is safe for all humanity and allows for the benefits of development to be reaped by all. Furthermore, we will promote and respect human rights in our climate actions. We stand in solidarity with our people and future generations to take urgent action on climate change. Over 60 years ago, Costa Rica decided to implement a countrywide strat strategy to generate electricity based on renewable sources of energy. Decades before, decades before climate change was considered a key development issue. 25 years later, a national park system was designed to conserve in situ the extraordinary biodiversity of the country in its remaining ecosystems. Our forefathers and policy makers were forward looking enough to establish financial mechanisms to generate fiscal resources aimed at maintaining, ma maintaining and expanding our forests. Under intense pressure at that time from international market dynamics, requiring raw material, materials and commodities produced on the basis of land use changes. During the 1990s, Costa Rica decided to strengthen the protected area system and to develop an innovative financial mechanism to promote for, to promote forest conservation and recovery by recognizing that ecosystem services deserved a special political approach to the extent that they were a bas basic natural endowment to advance pursuing human development goals. A tax on fossil fuel was implemented for the first time in a developing, developing country as a cross subsidy aimed at the maintenance and enhance, enhancement of forests and related ec ecosystem services. The program of payment for environmental services has been operating for 20 years and has allowed the country to invest more than 250 US dollars from uh, 250 million US dollars from public budget along with international loans and international cooperation and thus achieving the protection of environmental services in a total, total of 1 million hectares. That's around 25% of our country. Costa Rica, like many other countries, believes that the court to be signed in Paris in the following weeks ought to be concrete, short, durable in time, and based on a people-centered approach and has to call not just for country, but also citizen commitment. It also has to bring in a point of conver convergence to the sustainable development agenda. Today, 97% as a result of these efforts, today 97% of our electricity is renewable and generated by either hydro, solar, geothermal, meaning volcanoes, or wind power. We are the only, only tropical country that has reversed deforestation. And last but not least, our territory protects 5% of the world's biodiversity. 
Costa Rica wants to lead by example and maintains its political commitment, commitment to achieving carbon neutr neutrality. One of the main issues we need to continue tackling is the threat for our well-being and development as a nation coming from organized crime. Even though, as previously indicated, Costa Rica is safe, peaceful, and a responsible na nation, drug cartels use our territory as a pathway to move drugs to markets where they are consumed. Costa Rica in, its region has, in, in the region has shown a clear commitment to fight against this poison that destroys the souls and bodies of so many. Not only in the last two years my country has dismantled numerous bans dedicating to this illicit activity, but it has confiscated more drug than any other country in the region. Just to give you a brief example, from May 2014 to October 2015, more than 33,000 kilos of coca cocaine were seized. In this regard, we look forward to working together with Canada in facing together as partners and friends common security issues which are key to continue enjoying the peace and prosperity our countries and our people deserve. The Global Tourism Monitor Survey named Costa Rica as the most recommended touristic destination in the world amongst 65 assessed countries. Last year alone, we hosted more than 2.5 million visitors, the second, large, the second largest group of which are Canadians. We have direct flights from Montreal, Toronto, and in December, WestJet is inaugurating a new flight from Calgary. 27% of our tourists visiting Central America choose Costa Rica for its quality, infrastructure, safety, and certainly our friendly and educated people. This represents, tourism represents 5.3% of our GDP and it's growing at a 5 to 5% 5 rate. Our biggest asset, I have said it several times, is our people and our, and, our, and our unique model of sustainable tourism which attracts a responsible tourist that demands excellent service, unique natural beauties, in short, a distinctive travel experience. Many of our companies in this sector have achieved the sustainability certification which validates our responsible business and corporate business practices. The International Business Times has awarded Costa Rica with the most, most popular destination in the world for adventure tourism and the most eco-friendly destination in the Americas. Besides all the happy Canadians who visit us every year, between 15,000 to 20,000 Canadians live respectfully and joyfully among us. There is no wonder why hundreds of businesses have established their base in Costa Rica for Central America, the Caribbean, Latin America, as well as global service centers. Scotiabank, Four Seasons, the Conrad Group, Gilden, to name a few Canadian corporations. Amazon, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Mondelez, Bimbo, Bacardi, Bosch, Abbott, Boston Scientific, VMware, Citigroup are some of the hundreds of companies that have invested in our country and employ the talented and reliable Costa Rican workforce. We're working very hard in collaboration with different Canadian stakeholders to continue promoting business development between our two nations. However, there are important hurdles to continue pr promoting the friendly, cordial and a strategic relationship between Canadians and Costa Ricans. And these are the highly burdensome travel requirements for Costa Ricans who want to visit Canada. We need to continue having a respectful dialogue with Canadian authorities to repeal these requisites for our nations whose nationals do not migrate. Conversely, as Canada, we are a country open to the world with an enormous, enormous population of mig migrants living among us. Canadians and Costa Ricans dream that a better present and a better future is possible. Desiring peace, prosperity and happiness for our nations, strengthening democracy and promoting and protecting human rights in a diverse and multicultural societies. 
These are common shared values among our countries. Our president, my president, Luis Guillermo Solis, in a delightful speech when hosting some months ago the CELAC members, quotes the universal Gabriel Garcia Marquez with respect how to cope with what Marquez considered the solitude of Latin America. Garcia Marquez said to us, to Latin Americans, expect nothing from the 21st century. It is the 21st century expecting everything from you, ready to be created by you in our image and likeness. And it shall only be as ours and glorious as you are capable to imagine it. Certainly this 21st century, the century of Costa Rica, the century of Canada, the century of the Americas, shall be as prosperous, free and democratic, and democratic if we dare to dream and to work hard towards the accomplishments of what we have imagined. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Dormont is open to questions. Uh, we don't have a mic, but uh, just speak up, identify yourself. And who will be the first person to ask a question? Uh, Hal Smith, retired military. Comment first. My wife and I are amongst those Canadians who have had a wonderful holiday in Costa Rica. Uh, secondly, the question. You must have enemies somewhere. Yeah, we do. Uh, we do. Uh, however, my three kids are here, and for, for, since you're a retired military, for people it's sometimes hard to understand why don't we have a military. Um, there were unique conditions in 1948 when we abolished the army. Um, and I believe that was a, a, a clever decision at the moment. Um, it provided what we call the peace dividend. Instead of allocating uh, resources to a military at the moment, we allocated them to education and health. And we certainly have a very strong police uh, that take cares, take, takes care of, of security issues. But as I said before, um, Costa Ricans don't believe, we don't believe we need an army because we have been educated in peace. Let me give you a couple of examples. We have uh, several differences with our neighbors in the north, with the brothers and sisters from Nicaragua. And uh, uh, we have um, filed claims with the International Court of Law in The Hague, in the Netherlands, because we believe that that's where our disputes, our differences should be resolved. And that's a tradition, you know, that we understand it's unique to our country. I hope you visit again. Gabriel de Sartre, merci pour ce vibrant témoignage sur le Costa Rica. Peut-être que ma prochaine destination sera Costa Rica. Enchanté. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Un sujet qui était très populaire il y a 15 ans, c'était l'intégration des économies de l'Amérique centrale. Je ne vous ai pas du tout entendu là-dessus. Est-ce que vous auriez quelque chose à ajouter? Okay, if I understand what he's asking about the integration of Central America, what's unique about it? No, the economic. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, in this same podium, uh, some months ago, I, I, I made a presentation on the integration, economic integration of Central America. Uh, which uh, it's, it's called SICA. I don't know if you have heard the, the acronym, SICA. And um, it not only, uh, um, not only Central America, Panama are part of it, but also the Dino Dominican Republic. And uh, scholars say that this is the most integrated economic region in the world besides the European Union. So, um, you would find products and services uh, moving uh, freely between our nations. Um, for example, the energy market is totally integrated, logistics and so on and so forth. And many businesses, companies and entrepreneurs understand that uh, Central America is, is a bigger nation. I, I have here with me two ambassadors, uh, Her Excellency Rita um, uh, from, from Guatemala and Sofia Ardin from Honduras. And, and they, they can confirm that our economies are, are totally, totally integ integrated. Let me give you another example. As I said during the presentation that um, um, 
Costa Rica is an open economy and an open country for migration. We are, we are a population of five million Costa Ricans, five million, <coughs> and we have living with us peacefully and respectfully one million Nicaraguans that are very important for the development of our economy. Does that answer a little bit your, your question? Merci. Thank you. Merci. Thank you so much for your <coughs> excellent presentation. My mouth waters. You know, I think uh, I'm very keen to come to your country. Yes, you're invited. This is the land of uh, your region. Uh, I expect you to tell us about your political system. We didn't heard how the uh, political forces, election constitutions, and uh, but at the same time, do you tell us about the diversity of population in your society? <coughs> and also, I think you had a, at a certain point. Uh? At a certain point, you had a problem with migrants from other countries. When a country like yours is so safe, so attractive, maybe it's a migrant of others. And you have really the problem of uh, migration or illegal immigration. By the way, uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for your questions. I hope you visit. Thank you. Um, I'll start uh, with, with the political system. We are a republic. Uh, we have had uh, 120 years of democracy. Um, we have a president. It's a presidential system with, with three powers, uh, legislative, judicial, and executive. Um, elections are carried out every four years, and the president cannot, the president cannot be reelected consecutively. He, ha he has or she has to wait eight years. It's a rule. A strange rule, but that's the rule. <laughs> that's the, constitu the constitutional mandate. We have, um, we're very similar to Canada. We have three, the three largest parties are the Tories, the Conservatives, the Liberals, and a spin-off from the, from the Liberals, which I would say it's uh, similar to the NDP. So I would say uh, those are the three strongest parties. One is center-right, the other center-left, and the other center-left-left. Um, um, actually, uh, um, this, uh, my president, uh, Luis Guillermo Solis, uh, he's a, a scholar, he's an academic, he's a former diplomat, a former ambassador. Uh, he was secretary general to the liberals of Costa Rica, and he was part of the spin-off to the, to, the to the other party. He's, he's a social democrat. I would say, if you ask me what's... Uh, um, the ideology, if we can talk about that in these days, uh, my president and his party are social democrats. Um, we have had a, 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 a democracy where uh, parties between every four and eight years change of power. There's a change of power. Um, and I would say we, are, we have a very robust uh, democracy. Um, with respect to migration, as I said, Costa Rica is very open to, to, to migrants. My name is Roberto Dormon or, or Roberto Dormond, uh, which is uh, uh, from Switzerland, from, uh, from uh, Hollande de Vaux, near, near, near Geneva. And uh, my great grandfather came in the, eight, in the 1890s because he was hired by the Costa Rican government to teach Costa Ricans to produce cheese. Okay, so in those years, people you know, were coming from Russia, professors to, to teach mathematics, biology, and so on and so forth. So we have been always very, very open to, to, to migration. Uh, actually, uh, my father is Costa Rican, uh, second generation of Costa Ricans, but my mom's Mexican. Uh, my dad studied in the UNAM uh, uh, in Mexico uh, medicine. Um, but uh, uh, in recent years, since the late 70s, we have had a very important mi uh, migration inflow mi uh, from, from Nicaragua. And as I, as I tell you, we believe we have between 750,000 and 1 million Nicaraguans, who are a very important part of our economy. Um, uh, Nicaraguans work with us, and uh, um, um, they're a very, very important part of, 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 of our economy and of our families. Uh, these kids, uh, uh, you know, uh, their nanny is uh, a Nicaraguan that we love. She's back home, but uh, uh, um, so it's, it's very important. Um, some people say it's a problem. Personally, 
I don't believe uh, migration is a problem. We need, we need migration to continue fostering our, our economy. Um, but in the past, uh, um, you know, people from all over the world have come to live with us. Let me tell you that we have between 15 and 20,000 Canadians living with us. They either have a second home or have retired there. We have around 150,000 Americans, Venezuelans, Colombians, Spaniards, people from all over the world. Costa Rica is very, very open. Uh, actually, uh, I would say just a few countries in the world require visa to go into Costa Rica. And you're certainly invited. I will come. By, by the way, you stand the chance to be president. Who? You stand the chance to be president. Uh -huh. Our president, current president, was a former diplomat. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talk to my wife. <laughs> you talk to my wife. Another question? Hi, um, I'm an uh, undergraduate student um, in political science um, at Carleton University. Would you be able to tell us the story behind the, the Costa Rican flag, um, what the uh, coat of arms represents, and what the colors of the flag mean? Wow. Do <laughs> you want to answer that? Yeah. Um, this is my son, Emiliano. Stand up, stand up. <laughs> Okay, the coat of arms, this is, this I know. Uh, uh, these are the two oceans, as you know, uh, to the north, uh, it's Nicaragua, to the south, it's Panama, to the east, the Caribbean, and to the west, the Pacific. And we have a lot of active volcanoes. So these are vol volcanoes and uh, our mountain range. And uh, these stars are, we have seven provinces. So these represent the provinces of Costa Rica, seven. Okay, and why did Costa Rica decide to adopt that flag? Um, oh, as opposed to? <laughs> as opposed to some other flag. Yes, I would, I would say that the colors, the colors were uh, uh, inspired in, in, in the French flag. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. And what's the ship for? It's uh, the, the, the the Christopher Columbus uh, oh, yeah. ships. We're missing one, right? <laughs> yes, uh, I want to thank you and congratulate you for the presentation. Uh, since you came to, to Ottawa, you have been really putting forward your country, and, uh, and I think that by doing that, we, we go back uh, to a very important uh, um, message, which is the integration of Central America. And, uh, and I like very much your question because it uh, related to this system of Central American integration. And we have here uh, Miguel Angel, who has been uh, for many years working with the system of Central American integration. And uh, the importance of Canada engaging with SICA. This is something that, uh, that we know as uh, ambassadors to, to, uh, of SICA in Canada including the Dominican Republic, that we have been trying to engage uh, Canada more in the region in the uh, strategic, strategic, uh, democratic uh, strategy, uh, security, security democratic strategy, ESC, and in other initiatives in which Canada can also uh, engage more as other countries are the observers, uh, in the efforts of the region in a very, very particular issue, which is security that touches all of us. Certainly, uh, certainly. Touches the, the region, touches the world, because nobody is safe. Uh, whatever happens here, you never know where it's going to go. So that is one aspect. And of course, development. Development, how Canada, the environment is another important issue. And uh, in the case of Guatemala, Canada is very much engaged in uh, food security. Um, but we think that Canada has to engage more. And that I would like to leave that message um, in, in the region. Yes. And we, we have high hopes.
Let me just uh, uh, <coughs> make a couple of comments to what uh, Her Excellency Rita Claveri has said. Um, first of all, um, the four uh, embassies of Central America in Ottawa, uh, uh, we have a wonderful relationship, certainly, and um, that's a reflect of, uh, of an integrated e economy and uh, the closeness of, 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 of the topics and the agenda that we want to share with Canada. Certainly security, uh, it's an issue for the hemisphere. We have to work together in security, uh, and the environment. Actually, uh, if I recall correctly, we might uh, bring to COP21 in Paris a joint position on, on climate, our countries. Not only, not only our countries, but also it might include other countries such as Colombia and so on and so forth, if, if things go as they were planned. Um, but yes, I, I, I totally agree with you that uh, um, it's important to engage uh, as, as, as an area. And um, my president, Luis Guillermo Solis, uh, he is an integ integrationist. And actually, uh, one of his posts in the past, he was called Embajador Itinerante. How do you say that? Um, Itinerary ambassador? Well, yes, he's well, so well, 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 Roving. Roving ambassador to Central America in the, in the, in the late 1990s. So he's a true believer of the, some of the issues that, that Rita has discussed. Miguel, if you want to say something. Mm -hmm. uh, Miguel Feito, um, economic counselor of the Spanish Embassy. Uh, I told the ambassador I would ask him a comfortable question, not to make him uncomfortable, so that <laughs> you can see how bright he is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've talked about the integration in Central America. And uh, there are some countries in Central America, uh, San Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, even a newcomer like the uh, Dominican. Dominican Republic that are very much in favor. They are pushing all the time. But it is said that Costa Rica is a little bit skeptic. You know, they are not uh, pushing as other countries are to produce a not only economic, but also a political and social integration. Uh, do you think things are changing in the new government, or do you think that still TICOs are considered a little bit skeptical in the process of integration? I wouldn't say skeptical. This is, this is a good question, Miguel. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't say we're skeptical, and I would say that socially and economically we're absolutely integrated. Uh, uh, politically, you're right. Uh, the speed in which integration has taken place in other countries is not the speed that Costa Rica has had, and we have uh, required in different fora that we should uh, take our time to continue this, this, uh, this political integration, and certainly Costa Rica moves at, at a slower pace in this regard. But I would say at a political level, at the rest levels, we have a very, very fruitful uh, integration. One more. Thank you very much, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Yes. I beg your pardon, was somebody else there? No, you're on. Now. Okay, thank you. I'd like to, a question concerning this integration theme. You mentioned uh, your president addressing the CELAC meeting. Now, Canada is not a member of CELAC, and neither is the United States. In fact, I think we were purposely excluded from CELAC. So it's a, always been a mystery how we could talk about the hemisphere without Canada or the United States being present, given migration and drugs and the other themes that, that you've mentioned. So um, with Cuba now at the summit of the Americas and the OAS trying to rejuvenate itself, how do you see the future of America integration that, writ large in the hemisphere, given all these various groupings that yeah. exist at the moment. You, you're absolutely right. There are different groups, uh, different uh, integration fora. But we are absolutely committed to the OAS. Costa Rica is absolutely committed to the OAS, to strengthen the OAS, uh, because we believe that's the forum you know, to resolve the disputes in the hemisphere. And uh, my president and our government is absolutely committed uh, to, to, to this uh, uh, multilateral organization as the place for the hemisphere uh, to work out differences and to promote opportunities. This, this is a place, oh yes. One last question. <coughs> uh, my name is Kofi, I'm a graduate of a member of Canada and Africa. Uh, my question is, Costa Rica, since it lies on the south, only by oceans and other neighbors, is 
there any issues on maritime and coastal issues to the neighbors? Is there any? That's number one. Number two, uh, in Africa nowadays, uh, southeast, south, southern Asia, there are issues on maritime and coastal uh, I mean, conflicts with the other countries. Is there any lessons that we can learn of as well on how Costa Rica manages for those issues? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, our uh, maritime territory is much, much more bigger than our uh, land territory because there's a, an, an, an island which is a, a wonder of the world, which is Coco Island. I don't know if you have heard of it, uh, which uh, makes our maritime territory very, very big. We don't have conflicts with, with other countries uh, per se, but we certainly have issues. I'm going to tell you about two issues that we have. One, organized crime, because certainly through our, through our seas, uh, you know, uh, 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 the path of drug, uh, drug are smuggled from so south to north. So we have to tackle that issue as a hemisphere, you know, because uh, organized crime is a mul multinational organization. We have to tackle crime uh, as a hemisphere together uh, as friends and partners. So, so organized crime, it's an issue. And the other, uh, other issue is uh, protecting our, our natural resources. So uh, illegal fishing and so on and so forth. We have to work on that uh, to continue you know, uh, promoting a sustainable environment for our country and for their generations to come. But I would say those are the two issues we, have certainly, we certainly have to tackle. Thank you. I would like now to ask the Associate Vice President of Research and International at Carl University, Dr. Pauline Rankin, to thank our speaker. Well, on behalf of Carlton, it's my great pleasure to say gracias and merci for your comments this evening. When I took over my post in January, Ambassador Dermond was one of the very first ambassadors that I met and I've been trying to keep up with him ever since. Uh, he has, brings incredible energy and dynamism to his role, and we are very much looking forward to continuing that relationship. I can assure you that under his watch, there will be no solitude between Costa Rica and Canada. And I thank you very much for your comments tonight and for your dedication in pursuing the relationship between Costa Rica and Canada. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.